sociological theory lecture post coronavirus. Uh, this one is on a skeleton key to Paul Willis's Learning to Labor, another one of my absolute favorite books. It's a great book to teach, um, and it really is one of the better um, uh, studies of the link between culture, power, and uh, and class in contemporary capitalism. Uh, the book sold. It's 1977. The version that I use is the 1981 uh, Columbia Press. Um, version that has the introduction by Stanley Ronowitz, but despite its age, it's um, it's held up really well, and in many ways, I think the book is more important now than when it was written, um, in large part because of the significance of white working class men um, in contemporary politics. So, um, the book is uh, an in-depth ethnographic study of working class young men in Birmingham, or really in one of the suburbs of Birmingham. Uh, during the waning years of, of Fordism. And we're going to talk about what that means in just a minute. So these boys were about, what, 16 years old, uh, 17 years old in 1975 or so. So let's say that they're roughly 60 now. So these men fall in the demographic of the supporters for Donald Trump in America or uh, in, in Britain. They're, they're, they're clearly the pro-Brexit supporters in Britain and probably the UKIP supporters as well. So let's take a look at this. So, so, so in other words, what we know now, uh, looking back at um, the last few years of, of politics in America, is that the white working class no longer seems to be wedded to, um, to labor politics, uh, the politics of labor, the politics of unions, the politics of work, right? Um, where you're forging something like, uh, you know, uh, policy positions that aid, um, you know, uh, the conditions of work uh, versus, you know, the conditions of capital, something along those lines, uh, that seems to be waning. And instead, uh, we have um, this almost, um, it really is a strange sort of wedding uh, between uh, pro-business elites and some of the poorest and um, uh, 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 people in, in, in the system, as well as this, this, this block of white working class men um, and, and poor men and lower class men who support um, uh, right wing uh, figures and uh, certainly Republican figures uh, at the very least. So I write about political polarization and we know that the political parties have become much more uh, polarized here in America. So I'm, I'm uh, recording this in the um, interregnum between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. Um, it's it's uh, November 24th or something like that today, uh, Donald Trump has yet to concede the election. Um, it's really interesting that that uh, in 2016, um, you know, college-educated women uh, uh, supported Hillary Clinton in pretty significant numbers. They also supported Biden in pretty significant numbers. But uh, and and college graduate men, men with a college degree, uh, supported Trump net supporter of Trump by 14% in 2016, down to 3%. So women uh, shifted pr uh, against Trump by 2%, uh, uh, men by quite a bit more, college-educated men. So this group was really significant uh, for, for Trump's loss. But um, it's also interesting to see that women, non-college-educated non women, stayed virtually uh, the same. So something like working-class women in the United States, white working-class women, um, stayed more or less the same. And then this is um, men without a college degree. Uh, and again, whites. So 48% was the net margin of victory between uh, Trump and Biden. 48% margin of victory for white working class men. I mean, it's just astonishing. So again, if you have a college degree, whites with a college degree, white men uh, with a college degree, um, uh, really did not support uh, Trump at a particularly high rate, especially in 2020. Women with a college degree didn't at all. and uh, But men without a college degree, it's 48%, right? And that slipped six percentage points to 42%. But still, a remarkable um, affinity for the white working class or the white non-educated um, uh, uh, voter and, uh, and, and Trump and Trumpism. If you look at some of the swing states, the ones that have been in contention, this is from the uh, Brookings Institute. Um, so this is just something I just printed out from the Brookings Institute. But the, the um, let's see. So in Arizona, the one that matters is uh, the first column is non-whites, uh, so black and brown people in America. Um, massive uh, uh, 
you know, margins like in Georgia, um, you know, non-white voters in Georgia, 69 percent um, uh, uh, against net net negative against Trump. Right. That's the margin. Um, and then look at white working class down here. White working class men, men without a college degree. So again, there's a slippage from 2016 to 2020, but a but it really is remarkable to see that. Um, I mean, virtually, I mean, it's almost a lock in Georgia on white non-educated men uh, with Trump and Trumpism. A little bit less solid in uh, in Nevada than a place like Arizona. Um, you know, uh, Trump fell significantly among the non-educated um, uh, working class men. Um, but at any rate, I think this is what I really wanted to show is this huge affinity for whites uh, and, and specifically non-educated whites. So uh, Willis's book then is this ethnographic study of working class boys in a suburb of Birmingham, England. And what he's interested in is the way that, um, as he says, you know, the great first line to the first page of the book, um, um, the difficult thing he says to explain about how middle class kids get middle class jobs is why others let them. And the difficult thing to explain about how working class kids get working class jobs is why they let themselves. So it really is writing here about the self-defeat of the working class, or as he calls it, the self-sacrifice of the working class, um, or, or the self-damnation. He even uses the term the self-damnation of the working class. So what is it about working class kids that that makes that 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 um, blocks the avenues for education or for skilled work or for uh, upward mobility? What is it uh, in at least in the 1970s that blocked it? And what he found was is that these kids um, were those who actually were embedded in a working class culture that valorized the working class, that valorized manual labor in particular, and that viewed any kind of um, something like what uh, uh, cooperation with uh, teachers, cooperation with, uh, with school officials, uh, cooperation with management even, uh, the acquisition of skills, the acquisition of qualifications, anything that would have aided them in rising, that's something that was actually uh, somewhat effeminate um, so, or, or sissified in some way. And so to, uh, you know, th they were kind of locked into a masculinist culture, kind of toxic masculinist culture that, um, that wound up leading them to resist the very uh, forces that would have provided the opportunity to get out of the working class. Even more so, uh, uh, what he argues is, is that the white working class wound up forcing themselves in, uh, in. So here's what he writes on page three. I argue that it is their own culture, white male working class culture, which most effectively prepares working class lads for the manual giving of their labor power. Um, there's an element of self-damnation, right there it is, in the taking on of subordinate roles in Western capitalism. The damnation is experienced paradoxically as true learning, affirmation, appropriation, appropriation is a form of resistance. So just to say, this is like one of the reasons why I really like this book. The, the, these boys think that they're getting ahead. They think they're winning and they're actually harming themselves, right? So, so they think that they are resisting capitalism. They think that they're resisting, um, you know, management or resisting uh, teachers or resisting the man. And by so doing, uh, they actually wind up condemning themselves to a lifetime of labor in the lowest positions in society. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, you know, groups of working class labs comes to take a hand in their own damnation, the tragedy and the contradiction in these forms of, he calls it the penetration of, of this, of the logic of capital into the lives, into the dreams, into the, uh, you know, the life world of these boys, um, uh, are limited, distorted, and turned back on themselves, right? So it's a great study um, of how, you know, patriarchy, sexism, um, you know, uh, uh, racism, and this kind of this, 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 um, this masculine hostility to learning and to mental labor and to um, uh, honest cooperation with, um, with a, a, a formal system, a again, sort of uh, um, condemns these boys uh, to a future in the working class. So, so again, what the book is really about is how capital reproduces itself through the unconscious processes 
Again, this is happening behind the back of these boys. Consciously, they think they're winning, but behind the back, they're actually jacking themselves into a system that's going to extract their labor power with little pay for the rest of their lives. Okay? All right. So um, the study takes place in, uh, again, he calls it Hammertown, um, uh, again, the suburb of Birmingham. Um, it, it, it's a place that's really next to, uh, it, again, I'm not even certain where it's at exactly on the map, but it's very close to Kidderminster, uh, uh, Max Weber's, um, uh, you know, the place where Richard Baxter uh, uh, had his ministry, you know, the place that, that Max Weber thought, again, was like one of the oldest proletariats in the world and one that had one of the fastest transformations from um, uh, a, a non-capitalist ethic into the spirit of capitalism, right? He thought that there was a, a, a really rapid transformation there. Okay, so this, this working class self-defeats itself and reproduces the working class largely through uh, the opposition of, of these white working class men um, to, uh, to their culture. So, um, the, you know, I, I'm gonna admit to a private vice. I, for years, watched uh, uh, Top Gear when it was on the BBC. So um, Jeremy Clarkson and, uh, uh, God, I can't even remember the people's names anymore. This is all from Clarkson, I always remember. Um, um, God, isn't it awful? I can't even remember. They've been gone for a few years. So it's, uh, um, God, that is so strange. Anyhow, um, uh, but, but, but I watched the show a lot. These three men joked around. They had a laugh. They were often irreverent towards people of power and position. Um, Clarkson was ultimately fired because I think he punched a producer uh, late at night when a producer failed to deliver a um, um, a sandwich. I think he was he, his contract was not renewed and the show was canceled. I think is the way it worked. Um, so yeah, so uh, James May and uh, God, they called him Gerbil or something, didn't they? Hamster Richard Richard Hammond. Good Lord, I finally remember the names. Anyway, again, a private vice. But, but as I teach about um, Willis's book, I often have these three men in mind, especially Clarkson, who would have been of an age of the boys uh, in, in, uh, in, in Willis's book. So if you, want, if you need an image of what the culture produced, I think Jeremy Clarkson isn't a bad, isn't a bad thing. Again, not an unintelligent man, but, but someone who has this kind of oppositional stance uh, uh, to culture. Okay, so again, when I teach the book, I often talk about uh, how, how the, this is really a, a study in how education, uh, schooling, uh, reproduces inequality, right? And this is sort of a basic Marxist thesis from Bowles and Gintas forward. Um, you know, this basic 1970s thesis that, that education in America serves an ideological function where it, 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 it serves to create equality of opportunity and provide routes for upward mobility so that working class people can become professionals and, and so on. But in many ways, uh, what schooling in, in America and in global capitalism does is it reproduces the labor process and the, and the labor power of workers. Uh, and the primary task of education uh, is to ensure that most working and lower class kids remain uh, uh, available as working class uh, uh, bodies in the next uh, sort of round of capital. So it's, a, it's, it's about the reproduction of labor power, right? So my interest in the book is, is linked to that, but, but to me, the detailed account of the penetration of ideology into the life world of subjects is the main thing, that subjects or ideological subjects become interpolated and ensnared by their own resistance to the system. So this is a point that, that Foucault makes in, um, in, in, in the book um, History of Sexuality, that the resistance to power is built into power, that power knows you're going to resist it because power knows you're going to resistance, that it resisted that power, that resistance itself, your energy to resist power is used against you, right? And to, and actually sort of like the way I think about it is the last few feet or the last few inches um, uh, necessary to hook the extractive uh, sponge into you to extract your labor power Capital can't put it in you. You have to put it in yourself. And you're, the resistance to capitalism is what actually um, uh, ensnares these boys in, in, in the capitalist system, right? They wind up working class because of their own resistance to the very things that could have gotten them out of working class. So the working class schools are resisted because it's the man that they're fighting against or becoming sissified in some way. And by doing that, they wind up, again, jacking themselves into uh, the capitalist order. Okay, so this is linked to other research on schooling and the reproduction of inequality. You know, Pierre Bourdieu's great book in 1984, Distinction, uh, was one sort of a summary of earlier work that he did. 
you know, that education doesn't only produce alienated subjects and alienated work and uh, with rigid submission and, you know, uh, attendance and, and you know, uh, uh, submission to authority and doing repetitive work over and over and developing body disciplines that one sits in one's chair and so on for long periods of time. But it also reproduces cultural capital, right? And that, that is, that's associated with various social classes. And he argues that this is one of the main ways that social class is reproduced is through the taste um, uh, for culture and for the, um, uh, you know, the sort of um, acculturation into different standards of taste and different sort of styles of culture. Um, you know, I, 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 I was born and raised working class, um, but I have this, this strange distaste for much of the music of the working class of my youth. I just can't stomach it, right? Like if you played Tammy Wynette, or Conway Twitty uh, uh, to me, I would probably uh, get ill. It just, I find it really uh, horrible. I've actually find most, like even the uh, the pop music of, of the 1970s and 1980s, um, just distasteful. I don't know. It's a strange thing. But, 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 but you know, a kind of distaste for working class culture um, is something that's part of the middle class. And then, and then, you know, elite culture is even above that. And so, you know, a working class person can't really appreciate uh, you know, something like a Wagner, um, you know, opera, it, it's not possible to do because you don't have the kind of taste and, and the, the, the concepts and the, uh, to, to, to make sense of it or to, to speak about it in sort of educated terms. And then again, like elites really have very little taste for, um, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, mass produced canned beer and the hot dog world of, of the working class, right? Okay, so so power, class, and culture are wedded together in, in Bourdieu's work. So I'm giving it, this is a horridly short uh, portrait of this, and I, I feel bad for even teaching it, but, uh, but there you go. Um, Annette Leroux, uh, 2003, Unequal Childhoods. I haven't actually read the book. I've read articles about the book, and I've read articles that she's written uh, afterwards. But, but, you know, this is a, a work, um, Leroux sort of traces how families, uh, working class families and middle class families, are decisive in terms of shaping the way that children interact with the school system. And she claims that middle-class kids in America uh, tend to be raised by parents who encourage something called concerted cultivation, uh, that the middle-class kids um, ride herd over their children and very carefully uh, schedule their time and, and, and make certain that time is redeemed in kind of a productive way. Basically, uh, everything must must wind up on a college application or it isn't included in children's lives, right? And the working class kids are often uh, uh, raised with the logic of sort of natural growth. Um, so you're not, you're le much less scheduling, much, le much less parental investment in, in like formal activities and, and, and so on. Uh, and kids actually spend a lot more time uh, sort of uh, unstructured. So the parenting side of the classes winds up shaping uh, the way that kids uh, uh, fall into their lives. So Leroux says, you know, that the middle class uh, uh, style of concerted cultivation, you know, children are, are encouraged to discuss, engage in discourse, negotiate, uh, involve, um, you know, uh, ch the, the developing child is encouraged to help, again, participate in decision making, uh, becoming kind of self-managed in, 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 in a discursive way. And so the language of middle class uh, culture, school culture, and so on is cultivated through long discourse between parents and children in middle class homes. So uh, authority is something that's negotiated. Uh, um, language is used. You engage with authority. You learn the skill of, of, of talking with people in authority and even becoming an authority, right? You learn to question authority to a degree, finding the reasons for authority, that kind of thing. And then the structure of time, very a lot of formal activity, very structured time. And a sense of entitlement, she says, goes along with that. That, uh, um, and then in the working class of logic of natural growth, um, authority of parents and others it follows the logic of an order. Uh, so it's much more submission to authority, obedience to authority instead of negotiation with it. Um, and then a much more unstructured time, and um, yeah, and then sort of unplanned or unscheduled uh, uh, activities, right? So uh, a lot of independent use of time, uh, but, um, but it winds up into non-degreed employment, right? And so there's more autonomy at play, but also more submission at work. So she claims that, again, this reproduces middle class life. This winds up reproducing working class life. And just the logic of parenting winds up giving working class kids a leg up um, 
So this is, again, this is linked to what we're going to find out in, in Willis, right? So this book, it, you know, helps us understand uh, really in many ways the political economy of late capitalism, and especially role that sexist and, and racist um, uh, uh, cultures, working class cultures play in, um, you know, shutting down, I would say, you know, even the op upward mobility of, of the white working class. So this is very interesting. And, and we find this, you know, in, in, in cultures where uh, there's a lot of egalitarianism, all workers tend to do better. And in cultures where there's like white resistance to, um, to uh, non-white uh, labor force participation, and when there's male uh, resistance to women's labor force participation, it tends to depress wages everywhere. So it's one of those things where, where, where men resisting uh, women and, 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 again, maintaining a strong sexist and racist uh, world will wind up, again, ensnaring them in a world that precludes upward mobility. Okay? All right. So the moment when the book was researched and written in the late 1970s was the high tide of liberalism, the moment when Fordism, the structure of Fordism we're going to talk about in a moment, was collapsing, even though they didn't know it. And post-Fordism, where neoliberalism was beginning to consolidate and beginning to form. So the book was published in 1977. Margaret Thatcher entered the world stage a year later. Ronald Reagan, just a couple years after that. Um, you know, and um, yeah, and so, yeah, so, um, so the entire world that the lads inhabited is about to collapse, is about to change, and they cannot see it coming. And they can't see very much, actually, but they really can't see that the kind of relatively high wages supported by unions and labor party activism in Britain was about to decline. And that the kind of employment that they were getting that high that had high high wages and salary associated with it, high wages, not salary, but high wages, you know, working in, in, in big globally dominant industry and big factories and so on, that that was going to begin to um, uh, be taken away in outsourcing and globalization and, uh, and again, post-Fordism, destructuring, that kind of thing, restructuring. So clearly the unconscious structure, structure of the lad subjectivity was white male privilege. And that's, there's no doubt about that. It's a great study of that, right, uh, during the waning days of Fordism. So these men are relatively confident, these young boys are, that they're going to be able to have a decent life and probably make just as much money as the, um, the kids who study or the kids who try to acquire uh, skills and qualifications and get ahead. They think they're going to do fine, and in many ways they will because unions are strong and, and there's relative equality among the white working class, right? But that's about to go away. So David Redeker's great book, The Wages of Whiteness, um, and it talks about sort of the status wage, uh, the psychological premium that's paid to whites um, um, as such, and men as such, actually, in a um, heavily uh, redistributive world, one that kept egalitarian hopes alive um, with uh, taxes and redistribution, social policy, and so on among whites, uh, while hoarding opportunities among whites. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, David Redeker has written a lot about sort of the history of, of white uh, of the wages of whiteness, often not translated into money, but translates into relative uh, privilege, right? Whites were paid not just with cash, but were paid with prestige over uh, non-whites in America. And so that kind of kept wages suppressed and so on. But, but again, as we enter into post-Fordism, we're going to find that the egalitarian hopes and the redistributed social policy of Fordism itself of New Deal uh, America and social uh, uh, labor, the Labor Party of Britain was about to decline. Okay, so, you know, uh, just to point out really fast in my own work, I write about this, how Fordism was readily adapted or more sort of logical within Nordic and Rhineland uh, social democracies that already had something like a folkways and ethos that were supporting uh, collective welfare. They especially had sort of like a pietist or Quakerist underpinning or even a Calvinist underpinning at times uh, with an emphasis upon moral obligation between citizens in a society. And especially among the pietists, the desire to reduce suffering and the encumbrance of, of, um, of the burdens of life, right? You have to get rid of that so that people can be spiritual and be free and be productive. So the world of Fordism was a world of high levels of social democracy uh, and, and social democratic policy, social welfare, and so on. So the Nordic countries really taught, um, uh, yeah, were, were tied, again, had robust social democracy, right? And that Fordism was strongest there. I always teach this in my intro classes that Fordism, again, which decayed in America in the late 70s and on, 
held on more strongly in, in the Nordic countries, right? And that the Anglo-American countries sort of had a rapid, more rapid turn. Even the Romance Catholic uh, nations of, of, of sort of center West Europe, right, tended towards um, those that had a tendency towards fascism in the mid-20th century remained Fordist uh, uh, later on. So we're just going to skip that too. But the Anglo-American uh, uh, countries, especially those with strong Calvinist and Puritan and evangelical theologies, had, uh, especially as it as it emerged and sort of consolidated um, in the 1970s, began to really limit um, the support for um, for Fordism. Let's kind of skip some of that. That led us into uh, neoliberalism. I'm going to skip some of this. Yeah. So the turning point really for for the end of Fordism and the beginning of post Fordism uh, was the 1970s great U-turn, uh, to use the uh, the phrase from uh, Benjamin and 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 uh, uh, Bluestone and Harrison, um, that there was global capitalism that had displaced national culture. That was really the big move. That by the 1970s, capitalism was going global. National factories were shutting down. National corporations were shutting down and factories are being shifted uh, globally to low-cost labor markets. So the boys in Britain that Willis writes about in this uh, working-class school are about to have the factories that are going to employ them uh, shift the jobs elsewhere. They're going to find that their pay is going to decline. There's going to be a lot of redundancy, layoffs, and so on right around the corner. So life is going to be harder for them than they realize, okay? All right. So Fordism became unsustainable or untenable since high wages did not directly affect uh, uh, consumption, sales, and effective demand. Yeah, so as global capitalism took off in the 1970s, production went global and consumption went global. And when consumption went global, um, the support, f you couldn't sort of strengthen local national industries by, um, by high wages within your nation because um, your customers were everywhere in the world. So Fordism's uh, logic began to fall apart. So let's jump to what that was. So the project of Fordism, again, public policy, uh, 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 it was a political project, kind of even a, a, a political philosophy, in which national economies tended to dominate, managed by a, something called a Fordist state or a managerial state, or even a strong social state, to use the term uh, that uh, Thomas Piketty likes to use. Where, so the goal was to stabilize production and prevent uh, business cycles, depressions, and so on. And you did that primarily by stabilizing consumption with, uh, with relatively high wages, you know, uh, minimum wage laws and so on that stabilized wages. And, there, and, and then to have something like a capital labor accord that linked increases in productivity to increases in pay, right? And then that stabilize, you also stabilized uh, consumption through the political support uh, for uh, those who weren't working, and then there was all kinds of support for capitalism, uh, you know, high taxes upon um, the earnings, especially unearned income, uh, that was used to fund high social expenditures, again, a big social state, to support all kinds of, of, uh, of again, of state spending, of, of military spending, of welfare spending, of um, uh, social insurance spending, and so on, all of which helped stabilize uh, employment production, stabilized employment, and led to sort of uh, managed growth. So this is a world of managed capitalism, and uh, it was a world in which some sort of high wages uh, were viewed as something that was relatively good, a high standard of living for workers uh, was be, would be good for, uh, for capitalism and for good for profits, that kind of thing, because you had a national economy. So post-Fordism, uh, which we now really generally refer to as neoliberalism, really emerges in the 1970s, about the time that Willis is doing his work. Global capitalism began to dominate. Multinational corporations took off. I don't even really use that term anymore. Um, and a shrinking uh, social state um, was, was part of this, shrinking the state down, shrinking the state down. That was sort of the buzz uh, uh, word of, of, um, of neoliberalism, right? So you try to enable unfettered accumulation of capital, unfettered profits, um, by uh, by allowing for free financial speculation, you cut environmental regulations, you allow for mergers, acquisitions, um, you allow for cross-border mergers and acquisition, cross-border uh, finance, all kinds of activity that way, with little concern for stability within a nation um, and a lot of accumulation by dispossession. So those are a lot of f uh, sort of uh, uh, fancy $10 words. I'm going to leave them there. Um, let me see. There was consumption stabilized. Uh, yeah, consumption was no longer stabilized by um, 
public support. Instead, there was a lot of consumption that was stabilized with consumer credit. So this is the growth of the consumer credit markets, credit cards, and so on, uh, consumer debt, uh, and the pursuit of global consumers. This is coupled with, with wage cuts and sort of a lack of political, there was little political opposition to wage cuts because it was no longer tied to profit. Uh, work often became part-time and contingent. The rise of the, pro of, of the precariat uh, uh, emerges then. Massive increase in debt at all levels, right? Um, uh, right, and then sort of a uh, kill, uh, yeah, an attack upon unions. And then a massive political support for capitalism through propaganda, race, uh, you know, new, co new forms of race baiting, symbolic racism, and so on. Uh, tying religion into support for capitalism, um, emergent traditionalism that was then coupled in with capitalism in all kinds of bizarre ways. And, and then taxes uh, were cut for, um, for elites. Um, we saw this massive decline in taxes on, on capital gains, on, on, um, on dividends, um, while taxes on earned income tended to remain relatively high. Um, social insurance programs were cut or systematically underfunded. Um, yeah, all kinds of support for social, the social state and social uh, um, security uh, cut, you know, social welfare systems. And then the rise of ethno-nationalist movements comes later. So this is part of this project that's ongoing. So you see here the collapse of communism uh, and a containment of socialism. Um, national economies are dissolved by global capitalism. So you get a kind of a shift. The state becomes no longer a kind of regulatory apparatus that manages capitalism for high, uh, high employment and relatively high standard of living. Instead, after the 1970s, the state becomes a kind of agency to maintain political support for a world that fundamentally shifts uh, life chances away from workers and towards uh, capital itself, right? So the world of managed, stabilized wages, high uh, income, uh, managed unemployment and so on that 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 ended just at the moment that Willis is doing his work. So again, the boys that he's studying are walking into sort of a chainsaw and they don't even see it coming, right? They think that they're going to be continuing on in employment that is uh, again that that lifetime employment, uh, easy to find work, um, again, high wages, high benefits, a high social state or a social wage. Uh, subsidized housing, subsidized health care, uh, subsidized utilities, right? The world that, that Fordism had built, and that's all going to get washed away. And and uh, they're going to find themselves with declining fortunes, declining income. Uh, their wives are going to be out earning them during their lifetime. They don't see that coming. Um, racial minorities are going to be increasingly gaining a foothold in government and in uh, workplaces and displacing uh, um, uh, the white working class. They don't see that coming. So the world is going to be darker for these boys than they realize. Okay. Make sense? Okay. So that was the big turning point then, was the 1970s as this, as this goes on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the goal of Fordism then uh, was to sustain capital value by supporting production, sustaining the working class with social reproduction, and sustain commodities markets with government spending. Again, uh, the word Fordism comes from Henry Ford, who actually believed he could increase the demand for Ford cars by increasing the wages of his workers. So he dramatically increased uh, uh, wages and even created something, uh, was, was willing to, or voluntarily, not voluntarily under some pressure, was willing to cut hours that created more leisure, to create more demand for his car and so on. So it was this idea that you as a capitalist employer could actually manage the consumption of the products you produced and thereby stabilize production of your product by managing wages. So high wages, high standard of living were good. Cradle to grave uh, welfare support emerged within some of these national economies and so on. So you stabilize production to prevent capitalist devaluation and downturns. You stabilize consumption uh, to ensure um, yeah, that, that uh, market demand for mass produced commodities. Um, and then increasing the standard of living is really important there by keeping uh, the capital wage, uh, the capital labor accord in place. And then you stabilize the political support with high taxes on wealth and, um, and unearned income that was redistributed to support a strong social state. Again, that's the world that Willis's workers are in and it's the world that's about uh, to disappear. Okay. All right. Makes sense? So I know we just covered a lot in a little bit of time. So let's sort of take a breath on that. 
So Willis's book then, he's looking at working class boys in 1975 or so who are about to condemn themselves to a lifetime of working class labor. These boys are now the age of, of Jeremy Clarkson and the other men of Top Gear. They're the age of the white working class voters who tend to be the most ardent um, for Donald Trump for Brexit and other things, okay? So there's a mindset here that, that I think Willis helps us understand. Okay, so the essence of Willis's book then is he, he has this kind of distinction that goes on through the book. So we're going to try to try to emphasize the distinction. So on the one hand, he distinguishes between the formal institutional structure of schools. And the schools that he's studying are pretty good schools. They're schools that are primarily aimed at sort of skill acquisition, skilled trades, you know, and even, again, selecting boys that like school and then moving them up, um, uh, encouraging something like, you know, post-secondary education. Um, it is a, it's primarily a working class school, though, and it's, and it's an all-boys school, although there's a girls' school that's attached to it or that's affiliated with it. So, uh, th so he distinguishes between the formal world, the formal structure of, of where there's, you have a formal curriculum, you have a formal authority of the teacher and the principal and so on. Um, the education is, is all about training for success, trying to get children to realize what their calling is, the specific walk of life, the kind of Weberian sense, specific walk of life that they should pursue because it really means something to them, they're good at, they have the talent and taste for it. Teaching relationships are part of this. Uh, trust, negotiation with teachers, and so on, worrying about success and qualifications, having a kind of achievement motivation. That's the formal structure. And he contrasts that to the informal working class counter school culture. And this is what he thinks is decisive for jacking these boys into a lifetime of employment in factories. They want no part of this school. They think that this school is authority, so they're going to resist authority. They think of the school as a kind of form of, of, of local domination. They're going to resist that. They don't, they don't trust their teachers. They don't trust that this is going to help them get ahead. They think that they're headed basically for a lifetime of low-end, interchangeable employment as a generalized laborer within capitalism. So learning some advanced skill or going to school or submitting to the discipline of the teacher isn't going to help them any. They think they're headed to a factory, and as long as they're headed to a factory, why should you pay that much attention? And so, um, so they have this informal counter-school culture, working-class counter-school culture. And as we're going to find as the book progresses, this isn't something that's limited to boys' culture or teen culture. It's actually the entire working class has this dominant culture that resists the logic of the formal, that resists experts, that resists science, and those kinds of things as well. Although I'm going a little far beyond uh, uh, what he technically writes about. Okay, so so these boys and the self-damnation and the taking on of subordinate roles in Western capitalism, page three, that's what he's wor worried about. So they resist authority instead of cooperate with authority, uh, and they do not have a calling. They don't even think about a calling. They're just going to grind themselves up over a lifetime in a factory. There's no calling for that, right? And then uh, they're going to have a free, uh, yeah, they're going to be, they want to be free from authority as much as possible, resist to be free from it. So they kind of have a rebel mentality. Uh, while uh, submitting to authority at the last instance in the workplace to get their job. So there are people who are going to have to obey authority at the same time they want to resist it. So at work, when they're forced to work, they have to obey. They're constantly looking. We're going to find out to find these little spaces where they can get out of work. And then when they're not at work, that's when they think they're going to come alive. That's what these boys believe, right? Although we're going to find that they live in alienated existence anyway, and they don't exactly have a particularly good uh, out uh, non-work existence or out-of-work existence. Okay, so page 11. The op So we're going to go through a list of traits that are associated with this uh, informal uh, culture. Oh yeah, so uh, okay, so that's the main one is the formal versus the informal, the formal structure versus the informal working class counter school culture. And then we have the two main groups that live in the schools. The one are the conformists. These are the, the people the lads hate, the boys hate. So these are people they call ear holes, ear hole, or lobes, ear lobes. I just love that they wind up uh, catching the idea that the calling, <laughs> uh, the call, um, uh, really refers to you know the voice of God calling. So the ear is the place where the call penetrates, and that a person who has a calling hears the call of God. They also recognize to a, in a strange degree that authority generally. Uh, um, uh, 
comes to us through the word, right? The law is laid down through the word. And so the ear is usually the place you, you listen to authority, right? You listen to a teacher. You listen, right? And they keep talking about that, how much they hate these others for listening to, to the authority of the teachers and so on. And they don't mean just listening in the moment. They mean taking it seriously, right? Listening and then taking it in and incorporating the formal structure within the self. So the ear holes or the lobes on page 14, conformists, they actually think that technical training is going to lead them to have success. Uh, they may well wind up in the middle class, even though they're working class now, or they're at least going to wind up in the skilled trades. They're really trying to make themselves particularized within the larger economy, right? Not just getting themselves out there to work a generalized job, but to actually find some trade or some calling, some profession uh, where they're going to have uh, something like a career or a calling within it. So they tend to be diligent, deferential, respectful, and etc. That's all on page uh, 12. The lads, these are the boys that um, that Jeremy Clarkson is now the uh, the, the, the boys that, uh, that uh, Willis focuses upon, are oppositional. Uh, they tend to think that they're going to just be unskilled workers, so why learn skill? They're going to be manual laborers, so why learn mental labor? Uh, they're going to be in dead-end jobs, so why worry about a career and getting ahead? Um, they're indigent, uh, uh, confrontational, disrespectful, um, and they, um, yeah, th this idea of constrained rage, right, or, or uh, caged resentment, page 12, but, uh, an underlying notion. Okay, so that's the big oppositions, the formal school structure with the ear rolls, the conformists who, um, who sort of take that seriously, who listen to the teachers, listen to authority, and try to get ahead by getting through the formal curriculum well. The lads resist that. They're oppositional, confrontational. They don't want any part of this shit. And they think that they're going to wind up getting ahead anyway or just being no further behind because they're going to wind up as manual laborers working on skilled jobs anyway. So paying attention here is simply wasting time and extracting something like excess obedience from them that they don't want to do. So these lads think that the more that they resist, the less they obey, which creates something like a sense of freedom or at least a sense of masculinity within them. Okay, so page 11, the first big trait then, opposition to authority and rejection of, of the conformist, this other world, right? So the lads feel superior to the ear olds, they, uh, they're especially superior in terms of masculinity and sexuality. Uh, the conformists uh, are, res are resented by the lads, but the conformists also resent the lads um, because they disrupt education. Then only, we're going to find out they harass the shit out of them, but also <laughs> uh, they, 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 um, they also disrupt the educational process. So the conformists hate the lads or resent them because what, what the conformists want is to do well in school. And so time in school is time to acquire skills. It can be redeemed. And the lads don't just want to destroy the time of the school for themselves uh, and kill that time, but they also want to kill it for the conformists as well. So there's kind of an excess disruptive force here that catches the conformists as well, so they don't like it. That's page uh, 16. The lads dress fashionably in some odd way because they actually go out and earn money, and so they're so focused on that. The other working class kids who are conformists don't. They're work on, focused on school instead of earning, and so they don't dress as fashionably. Uh, the lads smoke and drink, cut class. Uh, they uh, go to pubs. They chase women and so on. And the parents of the lads uh, share with them this worldview. They're not really against this. They don't think of their boys as bad because they're skipping school or doing badly in school. They support it. So they all share this kind of anti-value or counter uh, value to the dominant culture, an oppositional culture. So an oppositional working class culture. So uh, page 22, uh, second trait, the informal group is superior to the formal authority or the formal structure. So the informal group of other lads is the primary world that these uh, boys are embedded in. So they're not really, um, um, again, they don't care about the teachers and they're not loners, right? Nor, this is interesting too, they're not really forming tight dyads with uh, girlfriends or something or best friends. They're really becoming part of a gang or something like a gang. So the lads are not loners, 
but they're immersed in an informal group of other lads. And the status within the informal group then uh, often comes from what we're going to find is action in Goffman's uh, terms. So your ability to resist getting caught, getting in trouble, having a laugh, causing, uh, you know, chasing women, being successful with women, scoring off of, off of the conformists, harassing them, uh, 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 taking their books, taking their lunch money. Um, uh, yeah, disrupting class, getting in trouble. This all gets you points. And then ultimately we're going to talk about, uh, about fighting and violence as the sort of ultimate way that you get honor and rise and fall in status among among the lads. So this is not, you, you don't get honor or status by being a good student. You don't get honor or status by getting good grades. You don't get honor and status by obeying a teacher, by being good. You get honor and status by disrupting the whole thing and ripping it up and, 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 and so on. Okay, page 26, um, dosing, sleeping <laughs> in class and outside or in other places, blagging, which is engaging in scams and cons to either get away from not doing work, cheating or something like that, or getting money, you know, in some way, blagging, getting away with things, blagging, lying to get out of things, or wagging, which is simply skipping class. So dosing, blagging, and wagging, um, sleeping, uh, 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 scamming, and skipping are... Um, are central activities of these boys. All right, so these are sort of funny terms. But again, the way that Willis describes it is because there is no honor and respect for the formal curriculum for the school itself. They work against it. They're constantly trying to carve out space and time and authority. They're trying to escape authority so that they can live some alternative life. So that's what dosing, uh, um, blagging, and wagging are about, getting these alternative spaces uh, to do something. And what they tend to do, page 27, is have a laugh, right? And, I, and I, I'm supposed to read that. I don't have, well, yeah, should I read that? Page 27. Let me show it. Yeah, having a laugh. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to read this out loud. I think fucking laughing is the most important thing. And fuck, gosh, I probably shouldn't. I tell you what, I won't read that word again. Uh, but I'll leave it on there that, that far. It's in the book, right? Uh, so it's part of these lads working class culture, right? Nothing ever stops me laughing. Um, and then it goes on again. There's all kinds of stuff where they're beating up other kids and so on. Uh, they're laughing. And it, you can get a kind of sense of that. I'll leave it on there. You can you can read it yourself. But but the boys use very colorful language. And, uh, and you know, they really like, like uh, disrupting things and causing trouble and, and scheming things, scamming things. You know, having a laugh. And the laugh is almost done at, there's always a victim of the laugh. It's almost always sadomasochistic in some way. All right. So, so the goal of the boys is to create time and freedom from authority in school that is then used for laughs, jokes, trickstering, uh, destructiveness, uh, irreverent um, uh, uh, activities, marauding uh, around neighborhoods and so on around the school even, uh, going on field trips and causing all kinds of trouble. And then the victims of the last, again, it almost always has a sadomasochistic quality. So there's the formal staff, the teachers, uh, the ear olds or the conformists, uh, each other, uh, women and girls, and then, and then racial minorities also. Really important. So we're going to find out in just a minute. Uh, but they also struggle for rank within the group. So this idea of taking a piss, they call it, or piss taking, where you're trying to directly attack uh, someone else in your group, kind of wind them up a little bit, try to get them to lose their cool, uh, challenge them to a fight in some way, some modest fight. And there's often sexual degradation uh, that goes on. It's often the topic of jokes is sex. So there's often a kind of a dirty sexual uh, uh, element to this too. Again, that would be considered dirty from the standpoint of the formal culture and from the middle class and even the, the conformists around them. So derisive, uh, they engage in lots of action, character contests, showdown, you know, chanciness, risk taking, uh, breaking rules and so on, trying to get thrown out, but not quite that kind of thing. So, so all kinds of oppositional culture, all done with a kind of unserious quality about it. And I think that that is really what matters. It's that is that the mode here is comic. You don't take the formal structure seriously, right? So that means the mask that you're wearing as a student or even as a worker isn't something that's particularly serious. You can take it off. So the weight of your soul isn't being uh, borne by your grades or by your uh, status as a worker or something, right? So, so it's unserious. So there's not a tragic quality uh, to the school. It doesn't matter. You get kicked out, it doesn't matter. You fail, it doesn't matter. It's all comic, right? You don't take any of it seriously, which is what the, the, the laughing is all about. 
So there's informal honor then and status within the group that is earned through fighting. Fighting is really important. So this is on like about page 35. It's the primary determinant of where you fall within the status ranking of the group, right? And, and again, just to say it, how, that this is that if you're a conformist or attempting to, to live a conformist life and get out of the working class, then the more you are a lad, the more you're going to be engaging in activity that's likely to get you ensnared in, in legal troubles and other things is going to keep you in the working class, right? So engaging in fighting, especially in school and out of school and so on, is, is not moving a conformist at all towards uh, towards the goal, but it's moving these folks towards the goals we're going to find. So generally, in-group violence is minimized. It happens all the time. There's all kinds of little, little uh, tussles going on, but they tend to target out groups. So ear olds, racial minorities are the main people who are targeted uh, for violence. Uh, and then there's symbolic and physical violence uh, occurs. So, so even when you're not fighting, you're taunting, uh, you're trying to challenge people to a, to a physical fight, uh, character contest, that kind of thing. Um, you know, you're maintaining a kind of rough presence. You're not even trying to conform to school uh, order. You're simply, uh, again, disrupting it, acting tough, that kind of thing. And there's a certain kind of masculinity to quote uh, um, uh, Willis here uh, that's being invoked. All right. Nights out are big where you're going out to nightclubs and dances or something like that as a time when you can um, chase women, the birds, as, as they're called here. Um, and, uh, yeah, the evening time off then is infinitely preferable to the day time on. Now, that's partly my words there. Page 38, the evening is better than the day. Time off from school or work is going to be better than work. So work is not a place where you find life. It's not a place where you find meaning. You find it off of work and generally in these kind of destructive oppositional activities of some kind. However, money is necessary. So life is lived outside of school. So school is bracketed, it's not life. And when you're in school, if you're going to try to find life, you're going to try to find it by disrupting it, by finding some space away from authority, again, by, by uh, dossing or something like that, um, by getting off. So, so the formal school itself is not life, life is outside. Okay? And, and as we're going to find, it's not really work. Work is going to be just the means to support life. So in Weber's term, this is quintessentially the traditional economic ethic. Work is something to do to support life. Work is not life. It's anti-Protestant ethic. All right. So money. So making money is necessary to support this entire lifestyle of the lads, right? And, and so they tend to get a job right away, and they tend to make money, and they tend to be dressed pretty well and go out a lot and that kind of stuff. And apparently, like, even some of the teachers are jealous of the, 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 the dress and the, the lifestyle, even the sexual conquest of some of the lads because that's, they're not, uh, not doing that. So anyway, so money-making then is a ticket to the lad's life. So money is important. And then, but I want to contrast that to the calling. So in, in, in the Weberian calling, you hear through your ear old uh, the call from God or, or uh, the big other um, to discern your talent and taste to define the place in the world that you should labor, right? The place where you should uh, pursue um, meaningful activity. And for, to the lads, that would be in school or in work, and they don't buy that. So to them... Again, you don't work to live in, in the, in the uh, spirit of capitalism. You're living to work in traditional economic ethic. Okay? All right. So money then uh, need not be earned through honest work. So again, this isn't an ethical earning way. You can get it through extortion, stealing, graft, uh, petty corruption. They talk about beating kids up, taking their lunch money, literally. So that's part of it. Okay, page 45. Sexism and racism come up. 47 is racism. 45 is primarily sexism, although racism is also blended in there. So it's a boundary mechanism, a boundary maintenance for the lads. They're all white, right? And even though, uh, uh, you know, the way that uh, Willis talks about the emergence of what he calls a kind of hyper lads culture, hyper oppositional culture among the um, West Indian population, um, he said that that hasn't really uh, fully organized yet. So in other words, the West Indians, the blacks um, in the community, are probably every bit as much of lads as the whites are, but that but the race overrides. It's going to be important. Uh, in fact, I'll jump down to that. On page 47 on, on when he writes about race, he argues that race trumps class. And race trumps the earl conformist distinction. So the whites who are conformists are accepted by the lads when in opposition to the Asians, you know, Indians and really Pakistanis, 
uh, versus and, and West Indians, right? That, that that race overrides it. So conformist whites and 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 lads come together in opposition uh, to to uh, to outsiders that way. So it's kind of interesting that that race uh, overcomes. Okay, so when I teach this in class, I always talk about about uh, Klaus Tavelite. Other pe he's getting this from other people, but where he argues that that. Um, Fascist mentalities or authoritarian mentalities or proto-fascist mentalities often arise in what he calls straight up fighting on two fronts. So Tavelite was writing about uh, the uh, Freikorps in, 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 in Germany right at the end of World War I. They were fighting. The two fronts were the sort of socialist working class that was organizing um, a, a kind of democratic republic in Germany. And they were fighting that movement of women and social democrats and Jews and others up. And then they were fighting against some of the aristocratic Junkers and stuff who were up here. They were trying to fight that. And so they, they, they had a, a war on two fronts. Here, uh, the lads are fighting a war on two fronts as well. On the one hand, they're fighting a war against the conformists or the middle class, the professionals, the teachers, uh, the managers that they're going to face who are above them in the order. So I don't even think they see capital as such. They don't even see it. What they see is some bossy um, uh, sissy telling them to get to work and to uh, show up on time and not to talk back. They see a teacher in front of them. And so I don't even think they see capital. What they see is the middle class representative of the authority of capital. So they see that pressing down upon them. So that's, the, that's one of the, of, the, of the fronts in which the battle is being waged. So there's this constant war going on trying to score off of the, the conformists and the, and the teachers and so on. But they've got a second war going on here. And that's what this is about, the sexism and racism. Um, women in, are, are talked about here in a really weird way. Women are not a threat to their economic well-being yet. They don't see feminism coming. So it's not part of the world. Women are about to take over uh, uh, the workforce, right? And, uh, and, and even the kind of employment that the lads are in. They don't see that. They see women primarily doing secretarial and clerical jobs. They don't see women doing uh, the kind of manly man labor that they're doing. So they don't see that, but they're about to, to be competitors for the jobs that they're in. They don't see it yet, but it's about to happen. But they do see immigrants and racial minorities and ethnic minorities um, as people who are threats. So they're worried about the, uh, the, the migrants. They're worried about the, pack the Pakis, they call them, right? or the uh, West Indians, as they're called in the book, um, you know, um, black and brown people are going to be working their way up, right? So they're really afraid of, of, of non-whites getting in to the white working class. So they're fighting this double war, and they get this kind of this locked-in mentality. where change. In other words, the, the, their working class status seems valuable to them in some way because they're resisting it from degradation from above. At the same time, they're resisting the imposition from below. So they're a straight of fighting on two fronts, therefore they're locked into something like an authoritarian uh, stru uh, structure. So there's solidarity then of, um, yeah, yeah, and, and we know this in our era, that there's solidarity then of sort of like upper class whites, like Donald Trump himself, a billionaire with soft hands, um, hairspray, uh, spray tan, uh, fake hair, um, um, you know, cologne. Um, and, and golf and own, owns golf courses and all that, you know, a billionaire. There's solidarity between a white upper strata man like that and then, um, and then the white working class men uh, who cheer for him. And that's largely done through down-hating and out-hating of minorities, uh, migrants, women, uh, and, and, and others. So there's, it's, it's really interesting that, that, that race is a trump. Race trumps the... Um, uh, I don't mean I don't even mean this is silly uh, uh, pun there, but it really does override the effect of, uh, of 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 class. So the solidarity of white to white overrides it. So we see it in this book when again that the lads are willing to bond together uh, with the um, you know with the, the conformists. Okay, but the the lads have an extraordinary conservative and patriarchal uh, gender uh, and sex. Um, uh, worldview. They, they really uh, buy in very deeply to the virgin whore uh, distinction. Um, uh, you know, they, 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 you know I, I'll mention Norbert Elias's writings on virtue versus honor. 
uh, that women don't have honor, women have virtue, he argues, at least in, 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 in the early modern world. And so the value of, of a specific girl or woman depends upon being very attractive, but, um, but without actually um, um, uh, being sexually active. Without, you know, so, so having sexual lure without sexual consummation is the key to being uh, a person of high virtue. And so the boys have a tendency to uh, pursue uh, women, and when and and if a woman yields, uh, or if they're capable of sexually assaulting or harassing a girl, then uh, then they become sexually experienced, and therefore they become degraded and scorned. And it's the girls who don't, who remain monogamous or virtuous in some way, are then called the misses, a substitute for the working class mother. And they have these bizarre kind of again mothering relationships. Um, uh, with with uh, with the girls that they date, the kind of asexual girls that they tend to date. So that's women. So women are not viewed primarily as competitors in the workplace or competitors for working class jobs. They're really uh, objects of, of of desire, and even objects of utilitarian use. In the end, the boys don't really want girls that they desire. They want utilitarian women who are going to function as housekeepers to do the labor of unwaged labor of social reproduction, right? And, uh, yeah. So just to, you know, some of this stuff is sort of, um, yeah, do I want to, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, I've got a right bird. I don't know. Some of this stuff is just amazing, the language that they use. Uh, I've, I've been going with her for 18 months now. Hers is good as gold. She wouldn't look at another chap. Uh, she's uh, effing done well. She's clean. She loves doing effing housework. Trousers I brought yesterday, I took them up last night, and her turned them up for me. She's as good as gold, and I want to get married as soon as I can. They do tend to marry young, too. So, so again, the model is, is, is the mother, and it's not, it's not intense sexual desire. It tends to be, again, this kind of instrumental uh, working class um, uh, coupling. Okay? All right, so then racism then, page 47, again, Asians and West Indians are the two minority populations uh, and migrant populations. The Asians, the uh, Indian Pakistani have, have, have kind of a, um, a, um, a, um, an, a habitus in the Bordeauxian sense of uh, a manner of, of an ear old, they say, conformist. They tend to be conformist, so they're, they're kind of doubly hated because they not only racialized others, but they're, but they're conformist. The West Indians, they have a bit more of affinity for because uh, they tend to have the same kind of lads' attitude towards the dominant cultures. They tend to be oppositional, confrontational. However, they're considered strong sexual rivals. And then there's incredible boundary maintenance that's maintained at the level of sex and sexual uh, conquest. All right, so chapter three, then we talk about class and institutional form of culture. So in chapter three, Willis broadens out the analysis and he says that essentially, the lads culture is a localized expression of a broader working class culture. So these teen boys aren't inventing a new culture, uh, uh, but you know, from scratch, but they are simply transferring the dominant working class culture that's around them into their school and then into their own lives. So the working class culture is something that was generated and created by capitalism, or it's, it's a response to capitalism, and the boys carry it into the school themselves. It's one of the arguments that he makes here. So the lads' informal counter-school culture, again, that has, uh, that has masculinity, uh, that has this, this sort of emphasis on chauvinism, toughness, um, right? Uh, yeah, uh, resistance and opposition, no calling, right, a formal, uh, resist the formal structure, uh, formal authority, that this shop floor culture where they're headed. So they're headed to factories and to shops with a shop floor culture that is going to be profoundly masculine, that also risks and oppose any notion of a calling and any formal structure. So what's crucial about not having a calling here is that the, um, is that the, 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 the workplace itself even the, is not to be taken over seriously, right? And especially the authority relations aren't to be taken over seriously, right? You're looking for a paycheck. The paycheck is taken seriously, but not the work itself. So if you can cut corners and do other things, it's okay. This is not ethical attitude towards work, right? It's you need the money, so that seems important. That's serious. You can't support your life without it. But the work itself, 
isn't. So you have this kind of comic attitude towards life. So what, you're, what, what he describes here is a kind of toxic masculine workplace culture where you're not um, engaged in the work itself, in the work process itself. Everything is aimed at maintaining that kind of tough, um, uh, destructive almost, manly informal culture. That that's what controls the workplace. It's often what controls hiring and firing. If manager, management hires someone that the local masculine labs don't like, they'll run that person out or they'll harass them out, right? So there'll be mobbing and workplace harassment that'll go on. So there's a control of work, page 54, and of shop floor, uh, and the shop floor uh, management is really maintained by the informal group, not the official authority. So in, in, in these working class establishments with strong unions that would have procedural rules that would make it difficult to fire anyone, um, it's hard for management to wrest control. So there's an informal control of the workplace by this masculinist, toxic, bullying group. So there's constant bullying, page 55, and intimidation of anyone who's a conformist, a, a, a rape buster, an ear hole, right? They literally, they're very cruel. They even talk about like like literally pissing in the tea. It's the, it's the term that's used in the book, right? Urinating in the tea of, of, of someone that uh, that is um, either, you know, a conformist or an ear hole. I can't remember the exact example. But, uh, but anyway, a lot of real, uh, again, destructive, uh, extreme versions of bullying. Okay, um, page 57, experience and practice matters more to these men and matters more on the shop floor than book learning and theory. So there's very little respect for, uh, for learning. Uh, you don't want anyone to be the fool of books, right? You want people who are simply going to have the experiences, submit to the experience and the practice on the floor. So it isn't just that you're, 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 you're setting aside the formal structure of management or the formal structure of authority, but you're actually setting aside expertise, uh, learning, book learning, science, uh, again, expertise, right? The only thing that matters is us at, at this local level, and we, are, we already know what we're doing, and we're going to keep doing it this way, something like that. So there's a rejection of outsiders and, of, again, of those who are coming in. Uh, and who are not submitting to the local. So I'm just going to make a quick shift to our moment. We're sitting in the middle of a, uh, of a pandemic. It is astonishing uh, yet that in the United States, unlike other nations, but in the United States, the wearing of masks has become partisan. And that, um, and that the, the men, especially white working class men, who are, uh, again, the, the kind of, uh, uh, that, that Willis is talking about, don't believe, um, medical expertise or social uh, uh, or community medicine of people and they, they, they quite, don't quite believe the community. They, you know, I, I'm from South Dakota last week. There was a report of a nurse who um, describes uh, patients dying, denying that they're sick of COVID as they're dying, gasping for breath, right? Just the denial of the science about what's even like, like the germ theory of disease doesn't even exist uh, to, to, to a certain category of person. So this, so if you reject book learning and knowledge and theory, you're really taking yourself out of, of uh, modern culture, right? You're you're living outside of reason. You're living outside of of uh, again reading, thought, science, and so on. And uh, and so, and so again, you know, you already you're always already sufficient in the traditional knowledge that you maintain. So it's kind of a a neo traditionalism living on in time within modern capitalism. So it's crucial that the work uh, that the working class shop floor workers and the lads are unable to know what they're doing. He says they think they are winning and by resisting authority, but in the end they're condemning themselves to this kind of labor. Right. So again, this idea that they're jacking themselves into this labor by being so resistant to any kind of learning or theory. So page 58 and 59, that working class kids in schools and communities without a strong informal oppositional uh, uh, dominant working class culture. Um, um, that say, for example, that don't mock conformists, um, actually do much better. So he, he, I really like page 15 to 59. It's one of the crucial passages in the text. He argues that it isn't class, social class as such, being a working class kid. That doesn't matter. And it doesn't even matter if you go to a working class school. What matters is whether the culture is dominant working class. If it's dominant working class, you're going to get the oppositional confrontational style. If you don't have that, then working class kids who find themselves in school will learn fine and they wind up acquiring the skills and acquiring the uh, language and acquiring the talent to be able to move up. 
So they wind up upwardly, upwardly mobile. So what Willis tells us here is it's actually working class culture that self-condemns working class kids to being working class. It isn't the school and it isn't the nature of being working class. It's the culture of being working class. Does that make sense? So it's the other working class people around you who enforce these norms of working class life that are against learning and against uh, cooperation and are against you know, uh, reason and against theory and against talent and against uh, qualifications and so on, but resist for the sake of resisting, right? That that then becomes um, the, the mechanism that ensnares those children into working class jobs. If they had gone to a different school without that dominant culture, where conforming isn't considered to be uh, uncool, right? They may well have earned their way out or worked their way out. So page 60, schools reproduce then the class order. The working class, uh, oppositional, informal culture is what actually reproduces um, uh, um, the working class, right? The working class is reproduced by their own opposition to the to to work uh, to the formal structure. So it's really strange. And so it's really weird. Again, this is a working class school preparing kids for working class jobs, but it's skilled trade. And because they resist doing that, they lock themselves into the lowest possible unskilled labor, right? So it's working class people, again, damning themselves to the lowest possible a form of of employment. Page uh, sixty. 62, um, yeah, okay, yeah, page 60, the emergence or conversion from ear hole to lad. That there's a kind of a conversion moment, like in evangelical Christianity, you can remember the very moment when you accepted Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior. The lads often remember the very moment when they stopped being an ear hole. It's like a rite of passage. I began uh, my life of, of, of coolness, uh, and I, I can remember when it was done. All right, so page 62 and 3, uh, the integration, yeah, so so the integration into the formal uh, 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 um, structure is uh, what the conformists do. They integrate themselves into the formal structure. The lads differentiate themselves from the formal structure. And again, he argues that this happens in the school, and then it happens in the larger world, that the working class world differentiates itself from the middle class, from the professional class, from the learned class, right, from theory, from, from, from and so on. So there's, a, there's an oppositional, right? So again, let's take a look at our moment. We're, we're seeing that, that Trumpism is rooted in a kind of rejection of mainstream, uh, what used to be called mainstream media, of the New York Times, of, of, uh, you know, of careful, thoughtful journalism, of careful, thoughtful political uh, opinion, of careful, thoughtful policy analysis, of expertise, um, and again, of social science as a mechanism to analyze policy and so on. So rejection of all of that and an embrace instead of this emotionally loaded, um, you know, media, this alternative media on the, on the cultural right, Fox News and, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, Alex Jones and things like that. It's all emotion uh, rather than, 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 than technical analysis. So, so this opposition then, the differentiation from formal structure, from learning, from school, from from sissified mental labor and so on, uh, continues on into life. Parents are also differentiated uh, from formal structure uh, later on. It's not just the lads themselves. So page 77 then. Uh, so it's the post-differentiation relationship. So once you become differentiated from the formal structure then, uh, the working class, the axis of power is different in the home versus the school. Again, the school, they want to differentiate themselves from that. Uh, but they're quite comfortable at home because the home is already working class. Middle class kids, though, the axis of power is identical in home and school. It's kind of formal. So this is like Leroux, um, the work that we looked at before, uh, where, you know, there's that um, cultivated, uh, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the cultivation of the middle class family of their middle, uh, of their kids is sort of uh, um, pointed to here, right? That, that, uh, that the logic at home becomes the logic of the middle class school, which becomes the logic of university and the logic of, of middle class employment. And for the, for the working class kids, school seems like an alien culture. It's different from, the, from home. So working class boys then leave school early. They don't stick around. They don't become skilled uh, and so on. They leave as soon as they can to just do unskilled labor uh, and because they were never really in school. They view school as something alien from the very beginning. So school is viewed then uh, as technically irrelevant or technically without value. It's useless. The fool of books. Uh, I think that's actually a line 
of, um, I've seen this, it's actually a line from a, uh, a Robert Frost poem, but my dad uses it. You're a fool of books. Anyway, um, so you waste time. Um, yeah, it's a waste of time to go to school. It seems to be all about domination and control, kind of surplus domination and control, being submissive to authority, uh, making you into a kind of submissive woman, so you resist that uh, with manly opposition, right? So you get that, that resistive, contrary, oppositional manliness, right, as a part of this. So after school, the school-to-work transition, page 95, qualifications in the formal sense these boys at least believe that the working class culture believes that qualifications in a formal sense are much less important um, than, uh, than being part of the informal lad tie network, right? So it's technically useless and irrelevant. And it's believed to be that, even by those who are working. And lads culture is what gets them their jobs, not the school. And even if one of the ear olds or the conformist gets a job and gets in to one of these shops with a lads culture inside, they don't last, and here's why. Page 96, the extreme humiliation, sadism, and perversion on the shop floor are so much more extreme uh, than what went on in, 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 in uh, it, it's really hard to comprehend uh, what, what he says, uh, what he describes, right? Um, yeah, that, that being thrown into this hellscape and being able to thrive or survive in it requires lads, not conformists, because the shop floor is dominated by, uh, by honestly, by former lads, the toughest nuts, the hardest uh, eggs, right? The toughest eggs in the place. And some of the, de you know, the descriptions here are chilling. Um, so again, if you've ever read about toxic workplaces, um, yeah, some of this description here is just, um, yeah, horrid. Yeah, so what they do to kids. Oh. I don't want to, yeah, I won't, I won't read. It's, it's too, it's too, um, anyway, just take a look at that if you wish. It's, it's in there. I, I don't want to read it. It's, too, it's actually, too, I, I can't read the words out loud almost. But the, so if you're a conformist and you find yourself in there, you're going to be hazed and harassed and bullied or uh, mobbed by the other workers, you won't last. So in a weird sort of way, and this is one of the arguments that, that he keeps making, in many ways, the logic of capital penetrates deep into working class culture and all the way into the school, and in a weird way, the boys are wrong because they wind up locking themselves in a working class life. But if they're gonna do working class life, they, in a weird way, they're actually prepping themselves appropriately for it. Because it's such a sadomasochistic hellscape in, 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 the, uh, in, in the shop floor that the, being a lad in school and being oppositional and so on was good training for it. So being a middle class, uh, yeah, middle class callings then are absent here. Jobs are not unique. Uh, it, it's generalized labor. There's nothing specific or special about any given job. And the lads view themselves, uh, they're indifferent to whatever specific job or work that they do. They view themselves and the jobs as interchangeable, as fungible in the technical sense. The lads view themselves uh, uh, in, in the formal system, as the formal system does, as again, as fungible and indifferent. So again, in a weird way, page 100, the lads are right. They view that it's worthless to, they themselves are not gonna be valued for having specific skills or abilities through generalized labor and that capital has actually defined their jobs in such a way. So it's a de-skilled, uh, you know, tailorized workplace, so it's not going to be there. Page 102, again, another uh, passage. That whatever this is, it's not a calling. You're, you don't take it seriously. There's, it's a kind of comic world. The paycheck is serious. The work isn't. Page 103, you resist mental work and prefer uh, pure, um, uh, pure uh, uh, physical work because mental work... Uh, it, requires responsibility. So that comic attitude, that lack of seriousness goes away. And again, if you have a salary, you carry the burden of your job 24 hours a day often, so you have to be responsible. And that becomes, again, you're losing the freedom from responsibility, the freedom from the logic of capital. And so masculinist uh, uh, um, lads don't want that. They want them to stay at labor. There's a kind of masculinity in labor, a toughness, you're not a sissy, and you, you don't push paper. You're tough, you're doing a man's work, 
and you're free from responsibility. That would, again, kind of, kind of prevent you from, remember, if work is time out of life, then you do not want a job that's going to go, go with you around the clock, right? Page 106, shop for culture is even more brutal, again, than counter school culture. Attack, toxic masculinity, racism, sexism, uh, you know, massive informal uh, cultural controls, hazing, and so on. So really, page 106, again, that section in there is where it's really hard to read. Page 112, boredom, sameness, uh, massive uh, uh, repetition, alienation from workaday life winds up being uh, the fate of these boys, right? So, uh, so because uh, the formal work itself... Um, yeah, so formal work is really boring and, and non-fun, so they look for non-work as the place where they find um, pleasure and where they find meaning, but again, their life is pretty devoid of meaning, and we're living in the age of the spectacle, and alienation permeates con consumption as well, and that these lads wind up not having much meaning there either, right? So so it, it winds up being a kind of an alienated world, is sort of what it describes, a kind of boredom, sameness. Uh, and, and so on. I'm supposed to read page 120. Um, so let's do that. Um, yeah, so here it is. The astonishing thing which this book attempts to present is, uh, is that there is a moment. It only needs to be this for the gates to shut on the future. In working class culture, when the manual giving of labor power represents both a freedom election and transcendence in a precise insertion into a system of exploitation and oppression for working class people, right? So that opposition to the thing closes the gate for everyone to wind up inserted in the lowest position uh, within the structure. Again, at the time, this is low in terms of status, but at least it's manly and it's not sissified in some way, but the pay is pretty good. In the intervening 40 years since this book was published, right, or, or 30, uh, yeah, 40 plus years since it was published, um, the pay of these lads has significantly declined. And the cost of not being educated is massive in comparison, right? All right. So I'm supposed to read that. Go to page 136. I'm supposed to read that. Um, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, this is about Harry Braverman and so on. No calling. The lads are indifferent to the particular form of work they enter. Their assumption of the inherent meaningless of work, of work, no matter what kind of right attitude they take to it, and their general sense of the similarity of all work as it faces them, is the form of cultural penetration of the real conditions of existence as members of class. The perspective on work offered by the counter school culture really is superior to that supplied sufficiently, officially by the school. Cultural recognition of the commodity form of labor power, the principal aspect of labor, which underlies and connects particular forms of labor, is the vital precondition for the limitations of subjective absorption on these things for the cultural exploitation and celebration of the lads of their own capacity for their own ends and purposes. So, in, in, so the, in, in other words, um, they were right. If they're, if they're going to work at the bottom of the system, being inserted in capitalism that de-skills labor anyway, attaining skills... Uh, by going to extra years of schooling and submitting to sissified teachers doesn't really do you much good because in the end you're just jammed in in the bottom anyhow. So you don't have a calling. So finding meaning in work or having the, the attitude, the mental attitude that work is tragic and work is really something that you should take seriously, um, the lads, again, the lads were right. In, in response to the real conditions of de-skilling uh, in capitalism, uh, callings are impossible. Therefore, the lads were sort of Again, they had it right. Okay, page 148 to 9. Um, there's a preference for manual labor among the lads. Uh, the lads are men who labor but do not listen, unlike sissies in white-collar jobs um, uh, viewed as, and these are viewed as women's jobs, clerking and secretaries. Again, this is, again, 1975 or so. Um, men do not sort of see what's about to happen. They cannot see feminism around the corner. Okay? And sexism leads to then, uh, again, to mental work being devalued. So page 150, toughness, uh, taking on dirty jobs and comfortable jobs that require manly uh, bravery, courage, toughness, and strength. That might get you a little bit of honor, but never by pushing a pencil or, or being a jockey of a keyboard. Okay, so the final points then, I, I mean, and this is really what's important, is that is that Willis argues that the, that the working class culture of this school, the boys wind up resisting the teachers, they resist the curriculum, 
They resist everything. They think they're tough. They don't want to do it right. They, they, they don't. So they push back against it, which is the same thing that the old man had done before their dad. And they're going to have an old missus at home anyway. And they think they're going to be reproducing this culture. So they resist immerse, immersing themselves in any kind of formal educational system that's going to get them out of there. They think they're going to get in there anyway. And they kind of want to be in there because at least they're men, right? And so you wind up then with... Um, um, with, with this strange thing that because they're resisting, they preclude any opportunity to get out and they wind up chaining themselves right to their own workstation at the bottom. They don't miss much though at the time, and that's what's really important because they weren't in post Fordism, they were in Fordism. So at the time that they wrote, the economic consequences of this self defeat weren't very high. But post Fordism, after 1975, right? We have seen the wages of working class men trend down. And we've seen unions trend down, right? And we have seen the pay difference uh, for those who don't have degrees fall. And so mental labor is now part of even many working class uh, jobs, right? And so, uh, so the white working class um, men have seen their wages fall significantly since 1977. And women and people of color have seen at least some increase in their wages, not to parity yet, but at least some, but especially those who have degrees, right? So, um, so again, feminism and civil rights, uh, um, employment, equal employment opportunity, um, and so on has made it possible for uh, there to be a rise in these subaltern groups. So in, in, in the image that we had drawn earlier of, of uh, the strata fighting on two fronts, right? that these lads are working class people, well, we're seeing that their wages have been cut as the professional class, the 1% and so on, has really escaped them. And then they've seen the rise of these groups from the bottom, women and minorities, into their position as well, as well as they've seen the jobs be shifted out, and there's been lots of redundancy and downsizing. So they're not just a strata fighting on two fronts. In many ways, they're fighting on all fronts. So you get this really this hunkered down uh, mentality, all right? So white male resentment, right? White racial re resentment is being studied everywhere in political psychology, and we're seeing a tremendous rise, not just in symbolic racism, but in old-fashioned direct racism, right? And I think that the Trump phenomena is linked to this in some way. As we see, white, white non-college educated men supported Trump, um, whereas like college educated women didn't, right? In, in incredible rates. Okay, so Willis then, lads in many ways have it right, right? That upward mobility through formal qualifications was unlikely or difficult, and it was distasteful. Again, even if you did move up, you wound up uh, getting into one of these sissified jobs that women would do, right? So they didn't view that mental labor as anything. It required submission to the formal structure, which is that surplus submission they didn't want to do. Men don't do that. And then they would also lose their uh, submersion in lab culture, which they don't want, right? Okay, so, so they had it right in a way. Being a lad was the best way to succeed, or at least to survive the world of, of shop floor culture, because it was run by former lads in an even more sadomasochistic way. So my final point, Trumpism, Brexiteers, and the lads in 2020, that I think that the lad and shop floor culture then uh, uh, tapped into, uh, has become tapped into directly by cultural conservatives. So, you know, in, in Britain, we know that the Labor Party has really been in decline and that working class support for labor has um, has somewhat been challenged by uh, support for uh, for conservatives. In America, we have seen an absolute flight of white working class men uh, from the uh, from a labor focused Democratic Party, the Democratic Party is no longer remotely focused on uh, as a labor party. But 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 we've seen a, a, a real shift from from um, from uh, the Democratic Party as the party of labor prior to like 1972 to today. White working class men are are in in, in the Republican Party of Trump uh, follow Trump. So so um, so yeah. So cultural elites who tend to dominate uh, right wing parties. Um, uh, have found a way to to take advantage of that resentment uh, to increase votes for uh, for conservative uh, uh, politics, right wing politics, and then second, the shop floor culture, lad culture, um, 
with its scorn for listening, its scorn for cooperation, its scorn for coordination, its scorn for sissy mental work, uh, I think was really important for killing unions and killing uh, the, the, the uh, successful mobilization of working class politics, the politics of work. That if you resist social democratic uh, people and if you res resist outreach to people of color or to women, uh, is it any doubt that, um, that, uh, that the slicing and dicing of workers leads to, um, to a dominance of parties that don't focus on worker well-being and worker policies, but often focus on tax cuts for elites and, and other things, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm being a little quick today with some of this, but, but again, I think that the results of the last election sort of link in, in an interesting way uh, with Willis. So Willis' book is really important. Again, my favorite point of it is that you often are installed within a system of inequality through your own resistance to it. Important way that ideology works. And then second, uh, that the men, that these boys that he wrote about are aging men now, aging white working class men, they didn't have the life they thought about. And they've shifted from, again, kind, kind of left-wing politics to right-wing politics. And that resentment uh, seems to be uh, tied uh, to the rise of the political right, both in America and Britain and elsewhere. Okay, take care.